Church in Del Mar on this third Sunday of Easter when we are also celebrating Reconciling Ministry Sunday. And we will be talking about what it means to be a reconciling congregation uh, throughout the service in different ways. So uh, we welcome you as we welcome all to uh, be fully a part of this worshiping community. Call your attention to the announcements that are there in the bulletin. Um, you'll see lots of handouts today. And one of them is, uh, is the announcement handout. Um, just want to point out a couple things uh, not on there. Um, there is a funeral happening here tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and there will be a reception following that. So just if you were uh, going to be stopping by to do anything else in the building, just wanted you to be aware that that will be happening in the sanctuary and in the fellowship hall uh, between the hours of uh, 1, and probably they'll be done uh, cleaned up about 7. So uh, just want to make sure you're aware of that. Also a reminder about the crop walk, and Ellie just asked me to... Uh, let you know that it would be great if you joined us downstairs for fellowship time following the service. That would be great anyway. Um, the Reconciling Ministries team has worked hard to put together uh, a special reception for us down there. Uh, but then uh, she will be down there to uh, give you information about the crop walk. We invite everyone to be part of our team. It would be great to have a, a wonderful turnout. It's not just about the money we raise. It's about the witness that we make by showing up and walking as well. So uh, it's really important if you can't walk, we uh, encourage you and appreciate your support financially, uh, but uh, it's also a great opportunity for children and families in our congregation. Uh, there is a shorter walk that's just a mile, so it's very uh, approachable for those who can't walk a longer distance uh, or who may not have uh, more time to stay uh, and do that on a Sunday afternoon uh, because of other activities or things. So uh, it's a great way to get children involved in uh, a hands-on way in the missions of our church. So. Uh, we really encourage our families to do that. Also, uh, the best way to, for you to contribute is watch in the Thursday e-news. Uh, and by the way, if you don't get our Thursday e-news, uh, if you see a visitor card in the uh, pews there, you can uh, fill that out and put your information there with your email. And uh, we'll uh, turn that in and we'll make sure that uh, we get you on there. Uh, but if you go to our Thursday email newsletter and you'll find a link in there for you to contribute, you can contribute to the team. And then as people get signed up, you can contribute to individuals if you'd uh, like to maybe to support some of the children who are walking or, or support specific people, so you'd be able to do that as well. And now let us center our hearts and minds for worship. <laughs>
cherished, valued. We believe you will like us. Make us people who recognize and proclaim your beauty and goodness in unexpected places. Surprise us, challenge us, transform us. We trust in you, Holy One, to reveal to us the sacredness of every life, of every way of being, of every physical manifestation of your spirit. May it be so. Please remain standing as we sing our opening. Here are these 
words of grace. You are a child of God, and they have named you. Holy, beloved, cherished, valued. No matter what the world says, no matter what the church says, you are a child of God. Holy, beloved, cherished, valued. You are a child of God. And now let us join in the Lord's Prayer. This morning's first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip, At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Kandasi. Kandasi was the title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you are reading? The man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants, because his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, who does the, about whom does this pro the prophet say this is? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, where Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself in Azotus. He traveled through that area, preaching the good news in all the cities until he reached Caesarea. So ends this reading of Holy Scripture. I invite the children to come forward and join me for some time up front together.
the way down this way. You guys don't want to have me. Rough morning. You can be happy now. So, today we are celebrating Reconciling Ministries Sunday, which is a big word, reconciling. Does anybody know what reconcile means? Even my sixth graders are like, mm, I don't know, reconcile, that's a big word, right? Any ideas? Who wants to, anybody want to just take a guess? Um, you welcome everyone. It, that's, in our case, it means we welcome everyone. It's a sign that we welcome everyone. But there are some churches out there that are called open and affirming congregations. There are some that are called welcoming congregations. But in the United Methodist Church, we use this word reconcile. Which doesn't necessarily mean you welcome everyone. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So reconcile means to bring together, or it means to um, make up when a relationship has been harmed or broken. Okay? So if you have a fight with somebody, and you get together with them, and you apologize, and you figure out a way that you can get past it, and come back together maybe as friends then that is how you reconcile, okay? So that's what reconcile means. So um, Easter is a season when it's really appropriate to talk about reconciling because Easter is a season where we remember that God said, I love human beings so much that I'm going to come and be among them as one of them so that they can hear from me in a different kind of way and know that I know how hard it is to be a human being that I know how hard it is for people um, and all the struggles they go through and all the pain they endure, but I want them to know how much I love them. And then so he says, I'm going to show them how much I love them and how we can help to reconcile our relationships so we can be closer together by um, giving up my life for them and then rising again on Easter and reappearing to them to be with them so that people know how much I love them and how big my love is for them. So that's how Jesus, how God reconciles us through Jesus. And so reconciling is how we come back together in relationship. So there are lots of people over the years throughout the history of the church who have been told in different ways that they're not welcome. And um, sometimes women were told that they're not fully welcome because they weren't allowed to have certain roles in the church. They weren't allowed to be leaders in the church uh, for a long time. And still in some Christian traditions, women weren't allowed to be pastors or to preach. Um, people of color, so often especially like African Americans in the United, or in the United States, and also in Methodism sometimes, were told that they weren't fully welcome. That they had to sit in the back or in the balcony. I know you guys think it's pretty cool to sit in the balcony, but um, they were told they had to sit there. They were told they had to wait and come for communion at the end. Um, and they weren't allowed to hold positions to be leaders in the church. And so um, they were told to worship in separate places. So um, lots of times throughout history, and sometimes there are other people, because of who they love, who they married, were also told that they weren't allowed to be um, in the church, that they weren't fully welcome there either. And so by reconciling, by saying we're a reconciling congregation, we're not only saying everybody is welcome, we're saying we know that a lot of times the church has told people they're not welcome, and we're sorry for that. And we want to make, uh, we want to heal that relationship. We want to um, be friends again. We want to fully welcome you. And we, we want to be honest about the fact that the reason you weren't here is because sometimes we told you that we didn't want you here. And we were wrong. So that's why it's called reconciling. We're called a reconciling congregation. That's what that word reconcile means. It means to make up with somebody, to and re restore and um, have a, a new relationship with that. Does that make sense? Okay. So now you have a little bit more knowledge about that. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in reconciling congregations that don't necessarily understand that. So it's really important um, that we do that. That's okay. Because we're going to have that there for us to touch later. In fact, when you guys leave, if you keep walking, yeah. If you guys all want to touch the water before you go, we're going to have that um, to think about and remember baptism. So um, if any of you want to walk by and touch the water before we go, you're welcome to do that. But let's have a prayer first before um, we go to Sunday school. 
Great and holy God, we give you thanks that you help us to remember that you know what it's like to be us. And we give you thanks that you help us through your grace and your love to reconcile our relationship, to make walk up with one another, to heal the broken places, and to come together as the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up. stays within the bounds of our annual conference. A uh, portion of it goes, I think half actually, goes uh, beyond our annual conference to Native American ministries in other parts of the country. Uh, and half of it stays here um, in our annual conference where we have ministries, uh, especially up um, on the Akwesasne Reservation in Hogansburg, uh, on the Onondaga Reservation, just uh, on the south side of Syracuse, um, and out in the Seneca Nation as well. Those are particular places where we have a United Methodist presence. And it also is a place where we have uh, experienced and been uh, the cause of, too often as a church, uh, a lot of separation and brokenness, and a place where we can offer hope and uh, reconciliation. And so uh, if it's something you're called to, I encourage you to support uh, this special Sunday offering. Uh, if you'd rather, you can go online on our website uh, where there's a place for digital giving, and you can contribute that way as well. Now the ushers will come forward to assist us in gathering tithes and offerings. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Give thanks to the Lord. Sing and do. 
Please join with me in our prayer of dedication. Awesome, holy, and loving God, we acknowledge that tears and smiles are both an important part of life. May these gifts be instrumental in wiping away tears and bringing smiles to your children throughout the world. Our prayer is that no one will miss the joy. Make it be so. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able as we sing together. That hymn is actually in the uh, Worship and Song Supplement, but they left off the third verse. And I feel like you need the third verse to bring it all together. So I happen to have it from another resource. And I just noticed as I was looking that it says Words and Music, copyright 2003. Uh, but I happen to know it was written well before that because I graduated from Drew University School of Theology in 1997, and we were singing it there back when I was a student. So. Uh, it goes back at least that far, uh, written by Mark Miller, who's the director of music there. Will you join with me in the prayers of the community? When so much of our world is groaning with injustice and destruction, we are invited to turn to God and one another. We are not meant to carry the struggles of the world alone. And so, in a spirit of collective embrace, may we share together in prayer for all that troubles our hearts. For all of the bodies in suffering, deprived of resources, withheld from care, or made into targets of violence, God, hear our prayers. For all those whose spirits are in despair, those who are facing loss or grief, those who are isolated, 
for those struggling to accept their own work. God, hear our prayers. For all the ways power is wielded over communities and individuals, for those living under oppressive forces, for the temptation towards complicity with injustice, and for the ways the church sometimes uses you, O oh God, as a weapon rather than a tool for healing and liberation. God, hear our prayers. Just as we are not meant to shoulder the world's pain alone, we are equally invited to delight with one another in the joy that sustains us. For the beauty that grows around us, God, we give you thanks. For the gifts of shared meals and community and relationships that transform and sustain us, God, we give you thanks. For art and music and stories and truths that foster love and connection, God, we give you thanks. For every source of courage in the face of all that makes us afraid, God, we give you thanks. For your presence within and around us, in our highs and lows, our hope and our despair, God, we give you thanks. Hear the prayers of our hearts, prayers of healing for Jean Fuller. Prayers for peace in the Middle East, we pray for the people of Israel and of Gaza and Iran and Syria and so many places where violence is all too much the norm. We pray also for peace in Ukraine and Russia. Deepen our willingness to show up with and for one another sharing in each other's burdens and working for one another's protection and care. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 15, beginning with the first verse. Will you rise as you are able to hear the gospel? I am the true vine, and my father is a vineyard keeper. He removes any of my branches that don't produce fruit, and he trims any branch that produces fruit, so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already trimmed because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. A branch can't produce fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Likewise, you can't produce fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my word, words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Back in probably February or March, 2016, I received a call from the senior pastor here at Del Mar First United Methodist Church, Reverend Deborah O'Connor Slater, who asked me if I might be available to come and be the presiding elder for a charge conference, that a church conference actually, that was going to be happening uh, here at Del Mar following worship, where they would be, you would be, as a congregation voting uh, to approve a statement that would make you a reconciling congregation. She called and asked me because when I was pastor at the Eastern Parkway United Methodist Church in Schenectady, we too walked through the reconciling process back in, that would have been about 2007, I think. 
And we walked through that process for a couple of years when we started it then. We made the final vote there in 2009. So it took two years. It took some time to walk through that journey to prepare ourselves. But she knew I had been through that and walked that walk with the congregation. And so she wanted me to come and be the presiding elder. There's really not much to that job. So little, in fact, that I don't think any of you remember that I was here. <laughs> some guy showed up and said, the motion is before you. All in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? Did we vote by written ballot? Yes, I think we did, yes. Here's your ballot. And then we waited while they counted. We got the results. And then I remember specifically what I said to you because it's what I would say to any reconciling congregation, any congregation who had made that decision I said, you have been on a journey to this point, but in many ways, your journey is just beginning. Because this is where the real work begins. And over the last eight years, you have been walking that walk in different kinds of ways, and perhaps gotten a glimpse of what I meant by that. That sometimes you think, this is what we need to do. We have a lot of excitement. We have a lot of enthusiasm. We get to that place and we make that decision and we're really proud of ourselves. And then it sort of settles in and you say, now what? What does it mean to truly live this out, to be a place of welcome and inclusion and of reconciliation? Because it's hard work to be out in the world and hear the painful stories of LGBTQ people who have been harmed in many ways by the church. Over the last several months, I've had the pleasure and honor to be part of the organizing committee that is forming and organizing the first Town of Bethlehem Pride event that will be hosted right here on the grounds of this congregation. There was some fear and trepidation among some folks about stepping into that kind of relationship with the church. It's great to have you along with us. We appreciate your support, but what's it going to be like for some of our folks in particular who have had terrible traumatic experiences of church to step into that place? And especially when the library for a time was not available for public meetings and they needed a place to gather, we said, we have plenty of space, let's just have the meetings of the church. And the folks on the committee, because they had gotten to know us a little bit, said, sure, we can do that, thank you so much for your hospitality. But there were a few voices who finally spoke up and said, I just can't do that. I'm sure they're lovely people, and I appreciate everything they're doing with us. But I'm not ready, I don't feel safe, I don't feel comfortable stepping into a church. That's a hard thing to hear. On the other hand, I know that's the reality for far too many people. I know that it's the reality because I've heard people's stories, and I've witnessed some of the things that have happened to people. I've witnessed some of the things that have been done to cause harm. I've watched the live streams of General Conference, where delegates have gotten up and said incredibly painful, dehumanizing things about gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender and queer people. I've been at our own annual conference sessions where I've heard people in talking about something like same-sex marriage then make comparisons to people marrying their pets or their toaster. Painful, dehumanizing, said about people who were there, 
or about people's children or grandchildren or siblings or parents. It's been interesting because again and again, the person who is the facilitator of the pride planning meetings, every time we talk about meeting somewhere other than a church, turns to me and says, not that we don't appreciate your hospitality. And I finally recently started to say to her, it's okay, I understand. You're not offending me. I get it. People even tell stories about going to talk to a group at another church, and at the end of their time together, the pastor's saying, well, can we pray with you? And turning that down because they don't know what exactly it is they're going to be praying for. Are you praying that I'll know God's love, or are you praying that God will change me into the thing that you think I should be? One of the things that's difficult for us as people who are open and inclusive in the way we view church and believe that God loves and welcomes everyone fully is that those who are in different sectors of the church, different parts of Christianity, those who disagree with us will often say, we are ignoring scripture. But today we heard one of the passages that for me is formational in how I understand God has welcomed me. We heard from the book of Acts a story, one of the many in the book of Acts, of God bursting open the doors of the church, providing a broad and expansive kind of welcome. Today, we heard of Philip being sent to journey with and share with someone who was excluded from full participation in the body of Christ, full participation in the worshiping and faith community, someone who, according to the law, was not able to fully enter in to the temple, was not able to fully be part of the worshiping community there in Jerusalem, who was not fully allowed to be in relationship with the faith community, and therefore with God. And after doing some theological reflection with Philip, this Ethiopian eunuch, a person who is a sexual minority and outcast, sees some water there and says, what is to keep me from being baptized? And Philip says, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. You are a child of God. You are beloved and cherished and perfect just the way you are. You are fully welcome to be a part of the worshiping community, of the body of Christ. God's love and grace is fully available to you. And in fact, we need you with us in order for us to be whole. Because when we are separated from one another, We are not fully the body of Christ. And so Philip baptizes him, welcoming him into the church. He doesn't require anything else of him other than to say, I want to be part of this. I want to receive God's grace and I want to be part of this community of believers. That's all there is to it. Again and again in the book of Acts, we are told that the early church expands its understanding of who's in to include everybody. Expands its understanding of who's in as defined by the gift of of healing and grace that's available in the waters of baptism. 
in the gifts of the Eucharist, in the ways in which we experience God's grace through breaking bread, sharing meals together, sitting down to reflect and study the scriptures, to serve one another, to take care of the poor and the outcast and the excluded. So everybody's in. If you are baptized, you're in. If you're not yet baptized, but you want to be a part of this community of believers, you're in. If you're a day old, you're a hundred years old, you're in. Because you are a child of God. In the first chapter of Genesis, it says, when God creates humanity, God does so in their image. God creates humanity in God's image. God's imprint is on you, no matter who you are. No matter who you are, God's imprint is on you. And when we are baptized, we remember that. When we remember and recall the gift of healing water, we remember that. That just as more than half of each one of us is water, and so it's very necessary to who we are. It's integral, integral to who we are and how we're made up. So is the Spirit of God. We have lots of ways that we can live out this gift of wealth. And it's important that we do so in a sense of humility and understanding that too often the church has been a place of harm, so it's not enough for us to say, you're welcome here. We have to prove it. We have to live it out day in, day out, over and over again. So that we can come to trust one another. We have to be patient and understand that there are people who are broken and have been broken too often by churches. By Christian communities who have told them they're not good enough to be loved by God. <coughs> that they're not fully welcome as who they are. It has cost lives. Literally. It has broken up families, torn parents apart from children, siblings apart from each other, all too often. And you, as a congregation, said eight years ago, enough. Enough. And not only is it going to stop, we're going to do everything we can to reconcile and restore the broken relationships. To provide not only a place of welcome, but a place of healing. That's what it is to be a reconciling congregation. To acknowledge the harm that we have caused. Or even been complicit in by our silence. And to offer God's grace as we have experienced. After one of our general conferences, where our delegates, by a thin majority, pronounced that we would continue to say, officially as United Methodists, that we believe that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, and that we would not ordain self-avowed practicing homosexuals. Mark Miller wrote a song called Child of God, where he says, no matter what the world says, I am a child of God, and you 
are a child of God. And no matter what the church says, decisions, pronouncements on you, you are a child of God. And there is nothing and no one who can separate you from that. Nothing and no one who can change that. You are a child of God. Each and every one of us as human beings bears that imprint. The image of God in us. Each and every one of us So, we have an opportunity to come forward, to touch the waters of baptism, to receive God's healing word, to experience that, and remember that in your baptism, God claimed you. So I invite you to join us in prayer as we prepare to remember our baptism. We give thanks, Holy One. The gift of water and spirit that claims us, heals us, and awakens your grace within us. As we remember our baptism, remind us of who we are, holy, loving, cherished, valued, children of God. We're invited to sing as you come forward as you wish to touch the water.
Creator God, we give you thanks for your spirit which is in each of us and for your image, your imprint, which reminds each of us that we are yours. And as such, we are beloved and cherished and holy and perfect. You called us very good. So we give you thanks for reminding us that no matter who we are, you created us to be who we are. It's in Christ's name we pray. church and in a family where it was always clear to us that there's nobody who's not good enough to be loved by God. That everyone should be welcome. For too many people and maybe for some or even many of you that has not been the case. I'm sorry. Though we may not always do it perfectly, we strive to be a place of welcome, a place of inclusion, a place that celebrates our diversity, and a place of healing and reconciliation. Some of you are really good at this. Thank you. There are many places out in the world that are 
about safe places for people of color, for women, for people with differing abilities, and for LGBTQ people. Shouldn't the church be a place of safety, a place of welcome, a place of healing? Go forth this day and take the church as a place of welcome and inclusion and healing, as a place of safety beyond these walls. Because what we do here isn't the only place that we are the church. One of my children once asked me Dad, why do you always say we'll do that after church when you mean after worship? Because shouldn't everything we do be church? Man, smart nine-year-olds. <laughs> be such a pain in the neck, right? But he was right. Everything we do is church. And if we are going to be a reconciling congregation, it needs to be not just about what we do on Sunday morning, not just what we do inside these walls, but also what we as individuals, as members of this representation of the body of Christ, do each and every day in all the places that we go. And so go and be reconciling Christians, reconciling United Methodists, reconciling people of God in all the places you go. Tomorrow and the next day and each and every day ahead.